Last year, I filmed with George Digweed, the greatest tutor on Earth. We hooked up with Aimpoint to test out whether red dot sights belonged on shotguns. Absolutely perfect. You haven't been offline one of those targets. We both thought it was great, but we also thought improvements needed to be made. That is way better. They've made those improvements and invited us back here to Barbary for a test. And hopefully I'm going to extract some knowledge from the greatest shotgun shooter on earth. Never shoot anything maintain lead. For what it's worth, I don't think that that is as consistent a method as coming through something from behind. All right, gentlemen, it's really good to be back here with you guys. We've listened to uh, what you had to say, George. Took that to heart. We actually developed the Acro S2. We actually made the dot a little bit bigger. These were the first Acro S2s ever made, so they're still marked 3.5 MOA. The red dot in these is actually 9 MOA. That makes the dot you're looking at the equivalent of a 9 inch circle at 100 yards. Production units will obviously say the right size. That will be interesting in itself yeah. uh, to see how that performs. Now one thing we didn't do when we did the last filming was for Johnny and I to know exactly how to set this up. You have eight different mounting pieces. A to D and then one to four. And in the box you get a chart where you can uh, get the information on which plate you would select. And that's just done off of measuring the height and width exactly. of your rib. So yeah. Because that's tapered all the way down, will have any effect at all on how you... Yeah, of course it will. You have to um, put it on the same spot if you want to keep the same uh, mounting plates. Yes. If you want to move it forward, you have to measure it again if you have a, a slightly... Uh, it has to be a vented rib, right? It has to be a ventilated rib, yeah, that's true. And it can't be carbon fiber. So here on this particular measurement, we have the, the number one, which goes on here. And that's just pressure fit. Yeah. And then we have the letter B that's on here. You can use this tool, the in-point acro tool. And then we can move it on the shotgun. So now where it's a tapered rib, I guess you're going to have to adjust that just to pinch and sit right in line with the rib. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So you want to see if it's straight. If it is slightly off, mm -hmm. how do you adjust it? You're using your hands. So you just loosen it, adjust, yeah. tighten it, and it'll exactly. pinch and, and yeah. lock in the right position yeah. eventually. You can also do like that to get a good, good feel of it. All right, so that took us, uh, what, three to four minutes to, to set it up? It was a lot quicker than I remember it being last time. Yeah. The new site on there, which looks a lot more streamlined, I've got to say, than the old one. Where does Aimpoint see their target audience? The good shooters would benefit from the site because they will see the line of a driven pheasant, a driven uh, clay target. The shooter who is more of an average shooter uh, would benefit from that as well. The beginners would get the right cheek contact because if you have the right cheek contact, you see the dot, dot in the center. Guaranteed sight picture. Yes, and also if you're having lessons by a professional, you can get a good sense of how much lead you would need on that particular target. How do I know that this is looking where my gun is shooting? Yeah, you need to see it. Uh, so here I have a mock-up uh, mm. models of a. Uh, uh, a shotgun shell with the primer removed, so you can easily do that on the range. Knock the primers out of them. The primers out. One in each barrel, and they can be used as diopter sights, so you get a clearer view of, of the so target in you, front. You look through the ring, the back, you line it up with the front of your muzzle, and then put the center in the middle. Exactly. Right. You take the target at 30 meters, look through the primer space here, and then you adjust with the key on the sight. This is up and down, this is right to left. And anyone who's zeroed a rifle sight, this should be pretty Yeah, yeah. Nature. But there, there's one thing we also had to mention, who will benefit from, from it also, and that's the cross-eyed dominance. That would be the biggest key for me. You know, when we did it at the West London, there were three or four people in the audience, left eye dominant, shooting off the right shoulder. Yeah. And it brought them into line on every single one. Yeah. Um, for me, that's a, that's a complete game changer in shooting. 
It really is. Uh, th those people can start to shoot uh, with both eyes open. Is it possible to have it here? Is it possible to have it here? And is it possible to have it here? It is possible. So that's a matter of preference. As we saw in, in West London, yeah. uh, you, Johnny, I, actually preferred it. I like it at the front, but then Eric loves it in his face. It's yeah. very strong left eye dominant. Yep. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have uh, a belief that it's going to benefit certainly half of the clay shooting community. Let's rock and roll. Yeah. I'm excited to see how this. <laughs> I yeah, best set my gun up first as well, I suppose. 3.14. 3.14. 7 mil. 7 mil, yeah. More or less. And that will give you the combination of C and 3. Testing station one, driven. I'm really interested to find out how these go uh, with you know the S2. I think that taking away a lot of the weight and a lot of the the diameter of the of the object will be easier to shoot. If we do three sort of different targets mm -hmm. and go through them in each stage, um, we'll see how we get on and 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 whether or not I think it makes a difference. What? Right. Big question, how would George Digweed shoot a driven bird? Technically, we're going to shoot this target from behind the bin. Effectively, the target's coming straight over you. So you would have to be, in my view, side on. So as I've gone side on, mm -hmm. my shoulder movement then only allows me to go forward and back. That's going to stop you pulling it and curling well, it out a lot. As soon as you open yourself out, you have to turn, otherwise you fall over. Mm -hmm. It's a human, it's a, you know, a human faculty that we, if, you, if you're not stood correctly, you're going to fall over. You're going to lose your balance and fall over. As soon as you start opening yourself out, this shoulder either drops or goes up, and this one will drop or go up according to which way that one's gone. So you're going to pull off line. So for me, we've got a dead straight bird coming over our head. We're going to look for the target out in front. We're going to hold below the line. And as that target comes, we're going to come through the target, touching the front edge, pull the trigger and keep the gun going, all in one movement. You're doing that from the feet up by the look of it. Your feet are almost parallel yeah, to the target as well. absolutely. But I push my hip to the bird. Not that I've seen my hips for years, but but what I'm, where I'm led to believe they are, I push that to the bird, and as I push that to the bird, my shoulders come back, but they come back square. Okay. Any good sportsman, in whatever field they are, cricket, tennis, squash, whatever they are, keep the head still and their shoulders square. And it's no different with shooting. The target is pretty much over, over the top of the bin. So I'm going to set up here. So I'm holding below the line of the target. On my call, I'll call pull. When the target comes, I'm going to come through it from behind, pull the trigger. Pull. Just as simple as that. There's no movement. You're just swinging through the target, pulling the trigger. All sport is economy of movement. It's, it's by doing the correct thing in the shortest time possible, because that leads to less mistakes. Yeah. The longer you're doing something, the more chance you've got of making mistakes. You're not making a big exaggerated movement, you're not gonna pull off line, you're not gonna to go to different places, you're just gonna come through the target, pull the trigger, and watch it disappear. Okay, so come in and have a shot. If you can just film this, don't move, mm -hmm. don't move at all. Gun's empty. Where's the target's coming from over the bin, and look at your stance, it's open. So, so you naturally, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say necessarily there, but it's coming, that's the line it's coming on. Okay. So that's pretty much where you want to be. At, the mo at that point when you were going to call for it, although it felt comfortable for you, you're still going to open your shoulders and pull outside. Died. <laughs> it died very well. Hung with it a bit longer than you did, but we're at different levels. As you're going through it and you get a bit more confident with it, just shoot it two or three yards earlier each time. That red dot, I remember, just takes a little while to ignore, right? You just need to trust that it comes up and building a faith Absolutely. relationship. Absolutely. 
But all you're doing is you're just looking at the front edge, looking through the S2. You're getting your you're getting your gun mount perspective. You're getting your line perspective from the red dot, but you're not seeing the red dot. You're looking through the sight. It's in your peripheral vision, although you're not focusing on it. As soon as you start to focus on it, you'll slow up because you're looking at two different things. Would you say that a target like this, most people will miss off the sides rather than in front or behind, generally speaking? Uh, I would say that most driven pheasants are missed offline rather than in front or behind. Because when you start shooting high pheasants, people give them ridiculous amounts of lead. And, and reality is it's probably the line they're missing them on, not the lead. The setup in your feet and your body is as important as your, you know, over the shoulder stuff. But interestingly, again, we've gone on to a driven target. Neither of us have been offline at all. No. Acro S2 is working. I have found, I mean, I just turned this on. It's a lot less bright than when I used it last time and before at all. And that's a much nicer thing to be in my peripheral than a bright red dot for yeah. me. Uh, for me, for me I, I feel as though because it's it's not much wider than, you know, well, it's no wider than the forend, it's narrower than the forend. The last one with all the knobs and everything else on the side of it, it almost felt as though you'd got a juggernaut coming in at you down the M1 on the wrong side of the road. This one is far more efficient, easy to handle. You really don't know it's there. It's very tactile. Very, yeah. very tactile. So we've mastered the easy one. Mastered. We've shot the easy one. Yeah. We've now got one probably three times the distance and twice the speed. Yeah, at least I would think, you know, you've got a proper tower target there that would, if it was a game bird, you'd be pleased to shoot it, whatever it was. So see how you get on with these. Would you shoot that as a driven or as a crosser? I'd shoot it as a driven, 100%. Okay. Exactly the same technique there, but you're going to need to really increase your gun speed. Do you see how you have to move? Yeah. Every time you've gone on the stand, you've set up and then thought, oh, can't do that, I've moved. So it just shows you how far you've been offline on your, on your driven birds up till now. You've been shooting it with an open stance, which probably leads to a consistency issue. Yeah. Bang on line, you're just probably, I don't know, two or three foot behind it at the moment. You're decelerating as you come to it rather than accelerating. It's not about how many you hit or how many you miss. It's about having an understanding of what you're doing. If you've got no understanding of what you're doing, you can't correct any mistakes. Oh. You're shooting at a target that is a big, big target. You know that you're behind it. You know that you're perfectly online. You've just got to swing that gun quicker. I mean, that was a huge amount of gun speed. I felt it. The gun speed is superficial. It's all about you moving and accelerating through the object. People talk about timing. You're only a good cover drive away from 100 in cricket. Well. Timing comes from the fact that you're doing things in a consistent manner, so you hit the same spot every time. When you're, you know, you don't, you talk about speed of swing, you don't play a tennis shot hoping that the ball's going to hit the racket. No. You play a tennis shot based on the speed that the ball's coming to you and the shot that you want to hit. Same with cricket. You don't play the same shot to a spinner as you would play a fast bowler. So... This is exactly the same. The first stand we went to, you absolutely ink spotted everything because it didn't need much reading, didn't need much gun speed. Mm -hmm. As soon as you as soon as you come to a stand that requires a lot of thought, you need to be able to throw everything caution to the wind and allow your mind to to go to the speed of the object so that you can stay with the speed of the object and at the last minute, increase the gun speed through it. Completed driven now, never miss again. Guaranteed by George Digweed. He touched me in a way that will mean I'll never miss. <laughs> Just lost for words. <laughs>
rabbits. We shot rabbits last time and we found this actually had a nice home with rabbits. Most rabbits are missed in front. Too much gun speed and probably over the top. So we all know about the qualities of this with regards to line. Your gun mounting needs to be strong. Um, but for me, I think that the visual effect of the red dot with regards to the target and where you're actually looking at the target will have a positive effect on where you shoot. You're definitely shooting below your eye line. Mm -hmm. So your weight when you're shooting this is going to need to be slightly forward of horizontal. Yeah. So that the gun actually allows, you're allowing your gun and the shoulders to go down and continue a solid movement without coming offline. If you set up to shoot this right to left rabbit, I don't see that there's anything wrong with that at all. Basically, the reason being is that way you've set up is you've set up to where you're going to finish your shot. You're going to come back here, hold below the line of the target, let that rabbit come, and and this is where your focus on the S2 and your focus on the rabbit is going to become vital because you're going to need to be looking and putting that red dot right where the rabbit is touching the ground. So your eyes, especially when you're looking down, it's, a, it's like taking a downhill rifle shot. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the amount of drop you need is not as much. So consequently, when you're looking down on a target, you need to look a little bit further underneath it to be able to get the line perfectly. So you're looking at the point where the rabbit touches the floor, not the target. You were smooth through the line of the target. But from what I saw, you both of your shot marks in the grass are within, you know, a foot and a half of each other. So for me, it's virtually the same place. When people struggle with rabbits, this aid is a complete game changer when it comes to a visual it aid. It slows that down massively, forces yeah. you to just focus on the rabbit, and it's very easy to put it, what, 10 inches in front of that? Yeah. Whereas I think most people get panicky because it's, it's a rabbit and just go, poo, with gun speed, and yeah. get cooked at that point, right? With the close driven, I felt that was a huge benefit. With the long driven, I think that would take some learning, but for this rabbit, like that, don't traditionally struggle with rabbits, but that just made it a piece But look, the, the, we are using this as an aid to people that are beginning, they've got eye dominance problems, and they want some picture in their head of what they need to do. When you're shooting a crossing target, the crossing target is all about footwork, making sure your shoulders are square again, making sure your head's still, and killing the target in the same place. Just the same as a rabbit, but you're now gonna be killing the same place in the sky. And you're gonna be opening yourself up a bit more for a crosser. 100%, so you open yourself up. Uh, whether you open yourself up with your foot or whether you actually open yourself up with your leg is actually up to you. Okay. So sometimes if I've got a really fast target, I will actually open my leg right out. Okay. So. So I can generate, so I've come back to start with and so I can generate... Your toes are at a greater angle. Yeah, okay. but I can generate, I've opened my leg up here inside my thigh so that I can completely get my body through the target mm -hmm. and I'm not restricting my gun speed at all. Some people would turn, especially on a slower target like this, which is a more precise shot, and they would turn more back into the target but open themselves out just by their foot so that it allows them to clear their hip by opening your foot out because your foot's facing that way. You can clear your hip, but you're not clearing your body. Uh, it's fascinating. I've never really thought about it in, in, in toe angle before, but you can't turn. And it's just a 20 degrees, and I'm now at 90 degrees without Absolutely. any issue. That's fascinating. Absolutely. So, you know, for me, for me, you have to look at the relative speed of the target, as we've talked about before. You know, there's no point in going massively massive gun speed on something that's slow. There's no point in having a slow gun speed on something that's massively fast or far away. You're so, an advocate of swing through on this sort of target as well. 100, look, I shoot swing through on 98% of my targets. Okay. I shoot swing through on 98% of my targets and, and this sort of target is an absolute ideal scenario for it. You've got a windy day, 
you can see that with the tops of those bushes. The target's going out into the wind and curling on the wind. So some of the targets are going to be lifted. Once you've got that gun in your face, it's very difficult to see that lift. And unless you're coming through it from behind, you won't read it, so you'll go off the wrong line. Okay. By having this sight and having the, having the fact of coming through it from behind, you're always going to be reading the line. And then all you've got to do is just the same as we said back there, come through the target from behind with a slight acceleration, pull the trigger on the front edge, keep the gun going, and the whole shot pattern will go into the target. I'll shoot the auto for the first few, because it's got the shot cam on. And then I'm going to see if the champ's gun turns me into. All good. Uh, I felt you were lazier on the second one than you were the first one. Purposefully. After the first one, the first one, you know, broke beautifully. After that, I think you thought you got a bit complacent. Every target needs the same amount of drive to kill it, whether it's an easy target or a hard target. They all count the same on the scorecard. For me, you shot it, but you were a little bit methodical in shooting it. So I would probably go a little bit further back to the trap yeah. and to drive yourself to make sure you're positive on the target, shoot it slightly earlier. I mean, I would walk in here without you here, I'd shoot that maintained lead. I think you'd say that wouldn't be preferable. Uh, look, everybody can shoot maintained lead. Yeah. Everybody can shoot maintained lead. You're asking me my opinion. Yeah. And, and for what it's worth, I don't think that that is as consistent a method as coming through something from behind. Never shoot anything maintain lead. If that target, if that target is in the wind and it's curling in the wind and it does that in the wind, you'll maintain lead. You've gone out here somewhere, so you're going to be underneath it. Okay. And same as if it drops in the wind and you come through here, you're going to be over the top of it. So for me, the only way you can generate line is to shoot that target with a bit of gun speed, coming through it from behind, you'll be consistent, you'll break it every single time. All right, let's rock and roll. I'll tell you what your maintained lead is. Your maintained lead is a big gap and stop, which is why on a lot of this, you're stopping as you make the shot, because you feel as though you've got to the end of your, at the end of your shot. A lot of people do it in maintained lead. You know, they go out in front of something, stop, and hope that their timing's good enough that it still works. Um, this is, there's no hiding place. You only get out what you put in, so you've got to swing the gun every time. Just shoot the same again, but give it a touch more gun speed. Oh, that oh. Just shoot four targets as you shot the last one. There's gonna be no coaching or anything in between it. Just shoot four targets, find your timing, and just find that place in the sky to Kill it every time. Oh. And as you've gone through it, your brakes have got better and better and better, and you've swung the gun more and more consistently. It's just, you can't, you can't shoot one method most of your life, and then in a few shots change. Mm -hmm. But what I've tried to give you is a perception of why the other methods work and why the other methods I believe is the most consistent method. No doubt it worked absolutely perfectly right and I'm not here to argue with you. You are probably correct. What I found easier is starting with a slightly higher gun because I was killing it earlier so I could get that red dot into my sight, get it mounted nice and in and put a drive on it and I think the early shots I was probably shooting from too low a gun and seeing as it's not fit ask there's nothing wrong with shooting a little higher right? Absolutely. Look, look, Fitask is Formula One. Fitask is the Formula One of clay shooting. It's the, it's the, the go-to event, the, you know, the, the, the best event that you can shoot. Yeah. It's the one to win. The one to win. But at the end of the day, we are not advocating that people that shoot Fitask should be shooting this. We are advocating that people, you know, you're shooting a 40 yard crosser here. Um, you're shooting a 40 yard crosser, which this is about the scope of where we want to yeah. be with this type of target and the target audience that Aimpoint are looking at for that site. By having an open mind on 
where this sits, the more I see it, the more I see that it has a market for people that, as, as Pedder said earlier on, they have a, a, a problem with their vision in the fact of master eye dominance. It helps people, no question at all, with that problem, get the right line. It also visually helps people that struggle to see lead and struggle to see what they're looking at down the range, gives them a visual effect with the red dot. And for me, I think, you know, if you're mounting the gun in the right place, so you're seeing the red dot every time, that's got to help you as well. I mean, if you shot with this, of this setup or that red dot on a gun, you shot it pre-mount, I don't think there's a lot of way you will, not, not a way you'll miss, but not a way you'll miss by leaving the gun. Because if the red dot disappears, you've left the gun. And it's automatically a fix for what you see in so many beginning shooters, lifting the head, rolling the head, not mounting the gun in any way correctly. Yeah. It is a, it's not a cure-all for talent or, or technique, but it's a bit of a... It's not gonna, it's not gonna turn you into an overnight world champion. But what it will do is it will make the the shots that are looking for that next level, it will give them some help. And it will give also the people that struggle with eye dominance, it will give them the belief that they can compete alongside people that have got it right. So that was an epic day. We got to be the first to try a product influenced by our own critique. More importantly, the improvements we suggested about reducing the housing sight and weight and increasing the red dot sight actually made the sight easier to use. And even more importantly, I got to learn some tricks from the greatest clay shooter who ever lived. How can you not love a day like that? For more info, head over to the Edgar Brothers website or check the links in the description. We took these aim points out pigeon shooting the very next day. So make sure your notifications are turned on for that one. Thanks for watching guys. What did you think? Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day.